It's all right. At least I know who my friends are because and, <laughs> Andrew will answer me. Uh, uh, just messing with you. Thanks so much for coming down. Are you ready Andrew to do very reckless? <laughs> uh, you ready to get the calls? Uh, I'm going to get. I'm going to get a phone call from Andrew. <laughs> uh, so, sure. so what we've got here, by the way, uh, just in that short little 30-minute discussion, $1,407. <laughs> so we already beat the crap out of Talk Heathen, so we'll be here probably till about 7 o'clock. Thank you guys so much for donating. Uh, I, yes, this was a bit of fun back and forth with Eric and myself, and, you know, we love each other. We're on each other's shows. It's obnoxious. Um, but I'm very, I, you know, I've been hosting the show for... For quite a while. 14 or 15 years. I don't know. Forever, uh, it seems. And I don't have any plans to quit. I'm constantly doing other things and, and I get sidetracked. But uh, don't ever think for a second that I don't greatly appreciate everybody who's watched, everybody who's called in, everybody who's sent emails telling me how wrong I am or how you know, bald or fat or whatever. It doesn't matter. This has been such a huge part of my life uh, and I don't ever want to take anything like this for granted. I am, you can ask the people in the back if I'm scheduled to be on a week and for whatever reason the schedule gets messed up and I can't be here, I, I'm upset. I, I would be here doing this show every single day if I could. Uh, so thank you so much for everybody who donated. We'll go ahead and do a long show and uh, buckle up going to be fun. All right. Well, uh, we, I want to start with somebody who we actually called in to talk heathen, and I asked him to continue or, or call in here so that maybe we could get to the clarification from a different uh, direction, and that's uh, Jonathan in Arizona. Thanks for waiting. You're on with Matt and Jeff, which is kind of like hey, Mutt yeah. and Jeff, which is shows how old I am. How you doing, Jonathan? Good. Um, boy, that didn't take long to uh, get those donations, did it? <laughs> No, it works out pretty good. I, I, I'm, I, I was optimistic that we would, uh, that we would get there, but you never know. And since Eric threw down the gauntlet, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled anybody's watching or calling. So, what have you, what do you got for us? Let's dig in a little bit on uh, your questions about morality. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> when we were talking earlier, uh, uh, me and Jeff and Eric, I guess. Uh, I, I kept coming back to that if if morality is subjective only, that it, it seems to me it keeps coming back to it's just a matter of individual opinion or the opinion of the consensus or society or culture or whatever. Um, anyway, it seems to come down to it, it's just a matter of, of opinion. And uh, I don't think uh, either I wasn't explaining it in the way where, where Eris understood how I was explaining it or we just... Uh, he disagreed with what I was saying and he tried to explain, you know, why and, and his reasoning behind it. But I just, I couldn't find any other way to come back to it. Always seems to turn sure. out to come back to, uh, you know, a matter of opinion. Yeah. And I was sitting out there listening and, and what I heard, there was, there was some confusion of terms that had people talking past each other. And rather than rehashing everything that happened on, on Talk Heathen, and because we're going to be on here a long time today and have a lot of calls, uh, I figure the easiest way to start, and, and if this goes horribly wrong, then I apologize for making you wait around and call into a second show. Um, I'm just always optimistic that there's some other way to have the conversation. So let me start right. with this. Define morality. What do you mean when you, when you, when you say the word morality? Um, so I guess uh, if I were to replace the word morality with what is... Uh, right or wrong you know what is what is good or evil and you know the common way that we understand these words that that's um, the problem um you, you, and i i'm in agreement with you I, i'm not i would agree somebody says hey define morality uh it's about right and wrong it's about good and evil uh the problem is when you say in the way we normally understand these terms because what we're doing there is just saying oh you know what i mean by morality and in reality, when, if you say morality is about right and wrong or good and evil, and then my next question to you has to be the two-year-old question of, well, what does that mean? 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 You can continue down this, this passageway. At some point, I think we're going to come to agreement, we may have right now, that by and large what we generally mean when we talk about morality is how do we go about 
making decisions such that we live a better life, that we are doing uh, more good than evil, that we are doing more things that are beneficial than um, harmful. Is that all still on board with your what we mean by right and wrong? Absolutely. Sure. Now, that makes all of this really easy. Because the truth is, no matter how you define morality, once you have a definition, you can then evaluate the consequences of actions with respect to that definition to see if we are consistent with it. So the, mm -hmm. there, there's a couple of concepts that I want to kind of clear up. One is that many times when people say objective morality, what they're actually talking about is absolute morality and vice versa. And these are two different things. And on the objective side, there's also two different components. There's the objective value, the standard by, uh, which we are going to use for comparison. And then there's the objective assessment, which is assessing the consequences of actions to this. I've, I've used chess quite often as an analogy. The rules of chess, we made them up. There's no, in the universe, there's no objective chess. Um, we've, we've made them up and we've changed the rules. We added in on passant rule and castling and things like that. We didn't. The people who, you know, changed the game centuries ago did that. But at the end right. of the day, the rules are ultimately arbitrary and chess could have been checkers or it could have been monopoly or whatever. But once we have that set of rules, we can evaluate whether or not a move is more likely to lead to a win or avoid a loss than it is to a loss. And we don't have to know everything about chess. We don't. We just played the world championship uh, over the last, I don't know, it was like from the 9th to the 28th or so. And Magnus Carlsen and Fabiana Caruana played in London. Uh, 12 games in the classical time format, drew every single game. And if I'm correct, that's the first time that that's happened. The, it has ended in a tie after classical before, I believe, but not drawing every game. I think when uh, Vichy Anand did it, they still drew, but uh, they each got a win. You're looking at me like I would have any clue. <laughs> oh, well, sorry, chess geek. I'm a chess geek, which is probably why I end up uh, using it as an analogy. So they had to go to a different time format. Now, that's not a change in the rules of the game, but it is a change in the situation. And so instead of playing a longer game format, they played a shorter game format. Um, and sorry, I love Fabi, but Magnus whooped his ass. I mean, it was just win, win, win. And it's because under those different time constraints, your ability to process information fundamentally changes. Mm -hmm. And you're relying on, on different uh, heuristics in a way. You're still playing the same game. Now, does that mean that because Magnus was able to win three games, that he is absolutely the best in every possible scenario? Well, no, because in the previous scenario, he tied. He and Fabi tied for 12 games straight. Uh, and they both, you know, made some mistakes, but they both played wonderfully. I mean, it's some of the best games ever, which would bore everybody to tears because they were draws. So setting aside the chess thing, if the question is, is there such thing as an absolute morality? Then my answer is no, because I view this as the situation in the context matters. And so you could see there's no, there's no truism, there's no moral truth that is an absolute, that applies in every single scenario. You can come up with perhaps incredibly outlandish scenarios where it would be justifiable to do anything. And, and the prime example that we go to in, in moral thought is something of, oh, I'm putting a gun to Jeff's head and I'm telling him, okay, uh, you need to make a decision. Do I kill those two people or those five people? And uh, if you don't make a decision, I'm going to kill all seven of them. So now, at a discrete level, we have Jeff is making a decision about whether two people, five people, or seven people die. And those are his only options. And he's, yes, he's doing this under duress so that he's not going to have to worry about going to jail. But the fact is he's being put in a position where he's forced to, to make a decision that has moral consequences. And it may be the case that refusing to make the decision and letting all seven be killed may be morally superior. It may be that going for the five is morally superior. It may be that's two. Um, nobody's pretending that we have all the answers. And right. this is why I'm fine with the notion of, of situations. 
So if we set aside moral absolute... Can I ask you a question real sure. quick? Just regarding the 257? Um, you said that uh, he's forced with a moral decision. Um, is, how, is it a, how is that decision uh, a moral decision? Well, the consequences of that action impact people's lives for better or worse. And as long as we're going to talk about whether or not it was right or wrong or good or evil, then the impact of, of, of actions on people's lives is, is the sort of thing that we would always have to consider, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, under like, you know, normal circumstances, everyday events, sure. Yeah, I mean, if you want to say, hey, it's, uh, it's good to skip the Atheist Experience TV show and go help the homeless as Phil did today. We, we miss you, Phil. Um, you, can say, you can say that, you know, that, that's a good thing. And if you want to, because that's about how it affects people's lives. Um, banging two rocks together has no moral consequence unless perhaps you start a fire that kills people. I mean, you can extrapolate these things out. But if we set aside, I, I don't think there's any absolute morality. And so now the question is, do we, we can in fact make objective assessments with respect to a goal. That's just an obvious fact that, I don't know anybody who would disagree with it. That if I say, mm -hmm. hey, morality is making the most money, it's not. But if we define morality as making the most money, now we can evaluate our actions to say, hey, did this earn me more money or did it not? So the real fundamental question at the basis is, do we have an objective value at the, at the core of what we're talking about with morality? Or mm -hmm. is this all you, just um, opinion? Well, if, if we agree that morality is about right and wrong, what we're really talking about there, as far as I can tell, is well-being. What benefits us and what detracts from our lives. And as long as we have that as a standard, then we are physical creatures in a physical universe where the laws of the universe dictate the consequences. It's not a matter of opinion that lopping my head off uh, is good or bad for me. This is just a, a fact derived from the way the universe works. And the only thing left to question, which you kind of questioned a little bit during Talk Heathen and other people did as well, and I realize this is difficult, is, well, why should I care about well-being? Clearly, it's subjective and a matter of opinion about whether or not I care about well-being. And you are, in fact, correct. However, I'll go with Sam Harris here because we're in agreement Consider health. Health isn't particularly well-defined and what may be healthy for you, me may not be healthy for you and there's always going to be uh, exceptions and examples. But by and large, we have a somewhat decent understanding of physical health and the food triangle and, you know, we learn stuff and improve. If you were having a conversation about health, would it ever occur to you to say, why do I care about health? No. And for me... This is functionally identical to the questions about morality. I think people make it harder than it is. Health is, hey, about our physical health. And you can, you can divide that up into mental health, you know, how healthy your blood is or your lungs or your, how far you can run or yeah, all these things. All these go into health. And I think if you take health, that is a huge chunk, by the way, of what I would describe as just general well-being that, we're, that I'm labeling morality. At the end of the day, if somebody says, well, when I define morality, it's not about well-being, fine. Then that person is not talking about the same thing I am. I, I don't think that that's true because much, and I'm not accusing you of this, when I asked you to define morality, you went with right and wrong, good and evil. Isn't that functionally what we mean when we talk about well-being? that we want to live the best life we can, one that's beneficial to us, one that, you know, doesn't uh, result in harm to us, the people that we love, the planet, you know, broadly, et cetera, um, that we want to take the actions that are better and we're looking for an objective foundation to better. And this is identical to me to saying, I want to take the actions that result in me being healthier physically. And those are physical facts. So I think morality is a lot easier than people make it. It's just that, what religions have done is given people the notion that there's some God out here who is like the fountain of moral truth. Not necessarily because he says it in the sense of divine command theory, but maybe because of who he is. The, the truth just exudes as part of God's nature. And there's a fear that if you, if you don't have that, that you devolve into chaos. Well, 
we can make up a new game, but we've got chess. And it doesn't matter whether the universe dictated, ah, here's the rules of chess. And if you lived your whole life saying, chess is only chess if the universe intrinsically dictated that these are the rules, and then you found out that it didn't, it wouldn't change the game of chess at all. It would only change your perception of it. And so this notion that we would devolve into chaos uh, or we would have no foundation upon which to make moral pronouncements is to me absurd. Because as long as you and I care about well-being, as long as you and I care about, hey, what does this action make you better? Does it make us better? And there's really some conflict in there. Nobody's pretending we've worked it all out. But if that's what we care about, then we can make objective assessments about our actions. And it doesn't matter that the foundation is ultimately arbitrary, although I would argue it's not because there's a very good reason for us to care about our well-being just as there is for our health. Does that clear things up a bit? Uh, you, uh, you've absolutely made, you know, there's a lot of good information in what you said. Um, uh, there was a couple things I wanted to, like, kind of touch on, uh, but I don't want to interrupt you. I wanted to... No, it's fine. Here's the rest of your thoughts. Um, <clears throat> so all of that does make perfect sense exactly how you said it. And I don't think I disagreed with anything in there. Um but I, I do have a question of um, if we're going to define morality as well-being, um, then I guess my question is, uh, is there any reason that I shouldn't only be concerned with my well-being and my family's well-being? Go ahead, Jeff. Um, well, because uh, if you, if that is all you do, if all you do is care about your own well-being, then there will be consequences for everybody else who cares about both your well-being and their own well-being. Um, mm. a- and frankly, um, if you – I think taken to its logical extent, if you care only about your well-being and your family's well-being, the best way to ensure their well-being – is to ensure the well-being of your community. Um, I, I am in complete agreement, violent agreement with Jeff, and <laughs> suspected that I would be. You can get to <laughs> altruism through purely selfish means because the, the part of the equation is that you and I have to share space on this planet, and what I do has potentially affects you, and what you do potentially affects me. And it's like, you know, hey, your, your question is like, why should I give a rat's ass about Jeff? I mean, that's really what that question breaks down to. And my answer is the same as Jeff's because our actions potentially overlap and have an impact, not only on our immediate lives, but on things like climate change and public policy and who we're going to vote for. And if I just vote what is in here, – here's the key. What you think is in your best interest may not be accurate. If, sure. you, if, you are right. focused, sure. if you are focused on your immediate gratification without consideration of the consequences, it, it's kind of like the – uh, well, if I could rob a bank and get away with it, why wouldn't I? Mm-hmm. Ah, because even if you get away with it, you robbing the bank has an impact on the broader society, which changes what interest rates people are going to get, how much uh, security is going to cost, whether or not banks go under, whether or not your money has any value. It may not seem immediately obvious, but the truth is we're in this really gross, ugly web um, where everything's intertwined. And it would be yeah. a horrible mistake to think that you, any of us, given a little bit of information, actually do know what's in our best interest. It takes a lot more work to figure out what's actually in our best interest. Right. I would only quote... Right, no, I absolutely understand that. And that's Uh that it's a a gross, ugly web. I think it's a rather amazing set of interactions we have going on. Ugly in the sense of... Messy. Trying to... Yes, messy. Uh, Don't get me wrong. It's a beautiful thing, but... I don't think those things are necessary in conflict. I'll be the sap today. So. No, 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 we're good. Does that clear things I, up a bunch, John? Um, yeah, it's, well, I wouldn't say clears a lot of things up, but all of it does make sense. Um, and I, again, I agree with everything you guys are saying. Um, uh, I did ask this question on Talk Eden, um, and I don't remember exactly what the answer was. Oh, yeah, I, I do remember what uh, Eric said, but I guess I, I'll, I'll ask him your opinion on uh, that as well. Okay. Um, so uh, when we're talking about well-being, and, and, and you know, when I'd ask a question like, why shouldn't my well-being, my family's well-being be the only concern for me? Um, right. it, it, this question kind of comes with that, I guess. Um, so hypothetical, uh, a little outlandish, but 
I, I'm asking this question because it goes to the deep root of is morality uh, more than just opinion? And this this question, I think, might help me understand if it is or not. Um, if my son is starving and I steal from another family who is starving to feed my son to keep him alive, and that family dies of starvation, did I do something immoral? Yes. And can you explain, like, why? Why was it immoral for me to keep my family alive? Yeah. I, 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 I wanted, if I, I wanted don't, to, my family dies, you know? Yeah. No, I wanted to give, I wanted to give you a succinct answer and then, and then offer some uh, exposition. And that is, you may well have made the best decision you could make given the available information at the time. Because um, I don't know whether or not you knew that it would, you know, result in this other family dying. Um, that's what we're all stuck doing. So when I say that morality is easier than it's often made, that's about getting over these, you know, metaphysical humps of we need some authority to, to say this is this. First of all, nothing, that, no, no objection you've raised and no objection anybody has ever raised with regard to secular moral systems is solved in any way by appealing to a God. So mm -hmm. at best case, whether you believe in a God or not, we're still stuck in this same boat with regard to foundations because in much the same way somebody could say, I don't care about well-being, I could say, well, I don't care what your God says. So it's possible for you to take an action that is ultimately immoral which, appeal, which appears to you at the time to be the most moral action that you can take because you are not in possession of all the information and none of us are. So the best we can do is one, make the best decision we can make with the information we have at the time, but it needs to be coupled with number two, which is constantly strive to improve the pool of information we have with which to make those decisions. And so if you... If you and your son were, were starving and you stole from a family and it saved your life and you saw that it didn't really seem to impact that family at all, that would be fundamentally different from your scenario where they end up dying. If after you found out that that family had died, if you found yourself in that same situation again, are you more likely or less likely to steal food from another family? Um, are you, you're asking me if, yeah, if this I'm was sorry. a hypothetical situation? Oh, okay. I've told uh, I need to do a better, I've been told I need to do a better job of inflecting my questions uh, so that they rise at the end so that they don't feel like statements. So let's do that. If you, <laughs> if you found out that that family died and you came across a similar situation in the future, would you be more likely or less likely to take the same action? That was awful. You know, honestly, I, I really don't know. I mean... I don't That's either. Question answer because we're talking about like you know. The, but, well, the, the, the let me let me toss child, you know? let me toss a question back to you. When when you stole from in your scenario, once it's done and the other family's dead, it would you look at that and say, "Wow, I took an immoral action," or "Wow, I took a moral action," and bad things resulted. Um, I would think it was immoral just stealing from someone to begin with, whether they died or not. Yeah, see, that's the thing. There's a way to look at it like that. I remember during Katrina, um, people, things that would have normally been called looting um, were initially called looting and then recognized as, you know, survival. survival. And it gets to the, the example of, you know, Jeff and I are walking down the street and I have a heart attack and Jeff looks in behind the glass at this pharmacy as a portable defibrillator. And so he breaks the glass and takes the defibrillator and uses it to revive me. Well, it seems to me that he, despite the fact that he's uh, violated somebody else's property, broken their glass, which is going to be expensive, taken a product that doesn't belong to him to use without, all of those things would be wrong. And yet, it may be the most moral decision he could make to save my life. Mm -hmm. And so, nobody's pretending that we have solved all the hard problems in morality. It's just that I don't think the hard problem of morality is... Hey, why do we care about well-being? Or do we have a good reason to make the decisions we make? We should just do it humbly realizing that we're going to get it wrong and to try to correct afterwards. Um, and there are situations where you are forced to make a decision and you got to do the best you can. 
And I'd say that part three of that is realizing when you're actually not forced to make a decision, when, when you are, there's an option to wait um, that we just don't want to do. That's probably one of the bigger mistakes. We good? Yeah, I was, I was just trying to, um, again, based on how everything that you've explained, everything does make sense. Um, it, it, does, it does come down to the terms, like you said at the beginning, um, how we define morality. If morality is well-being, then it's easy to you know, say what is objectively better to reach this well-being and worse. Yeah. Um, all of that makes perfect sense. Um, it, to me, it, it, it begs the question of, uh, and this, I hope this doesn't come off like I'm just trying to be argumentative or just come up with stupid, you know, stupid stuff to say, but, um, is there any objective, is there any objectivity to why well being should be, uh, nope. you know, nope. So it just, you already know my question. Is, <laughs> is there any objective reason why I should care about health? Nope. Oh, you can make circular arguments. I care about health because it's in my best interest. Well, why do you care about your best interest? Well, I do. Uh, yeah, th there's no way out of that. But the truth is, right. when you get people down and, and you're actually being honest, I have yet to meet anybody who will flatly say, I don't care about my best interest. Yeah. Those people tend to not survive. <laughs> and we are the descendants of people who cared about our best interest.